Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Keenan, and tonight we're going to talk about hormones. We're going to answer questions about hormones and health. So I'm going to get started um, speaking, and then we're going to go into um, a personal question and answer session um, in just a little bit. So let me begin. So well, there are so many different topics to cover when it comes to hormones health. So I thought I would go with what you have for questions. So let me begin. So question, can your estrogen be tested and show normal range, but still having symptoms? Yes. Okay. So symptoms do not correlate to your blood testing. Okay. So we know that completely from before that symptoms don't correlate. Um, I'm just going to put, okay. Symptoms do not correlate to um, to what your blood test is showing. So when we get, so then you might ask, well, then how do I know if I need hormones? Well, we base it on where you are and your symptoms. So this is going to change if you're in perimenopause or postmenopause. So remember, perimenopause means that you're still having regular periods. This is what because you're still leading up to menopause. That's the ten years or so before um, menopause happens. And so um, I'm just gonna put this down here. Here we go, back to gallery. Uh, the tenor, so in that age, estrogen is fluctuating. So number one, you might be getting a period regularly every month. So estrogen during the month of a period generally does go through fluctuations of two little elevations during the month of the period. But in perimenopause, something happens. And during that time, um, your estrogen can fluctuate to super high and to super low. And for those of you that might remember that time, or maybe you're in it right now, what that kind of shows is, is that your periods start to become irregular. So if we measure a blood test and you're 48 years old, your periods are 30 days and then they go to 60 and then they go to 90, we're not really going to get an accurate reflection of what your um, what's going on in your body because it's just not a standard static dose. So this differs a little bit than a vitamin level, for example. So vitamin D, vitamin B12, we can measure these levels. Your blood sugar, your... Um, so those we know, those are a standard fixed number, but it's not a standard fixed number when it comes to your estrogen levels. Now, there are times that I would check an estrogen level. So I'm going to check it if I'm looking at someone that maybe has PCOS, so polycystic ovarian syndrome. So for that woman, I'm gonna check a few things, estrogen, uh, progesterone, testosterone. I'm gonna check uh, uh, LH and FSH because there can be a few other things that are going on. I also might check an estrogen level when I am looking at therapy for a patient. So some women do not absorb estrogen that well through their skin. Some women absorb it differently, whether it's in a patch or in a gel. Um, and some women actually do need oral estrogen because they don't absorb it through their skin. And the way that we can tell if you're absorbing is if your blood estrogen level goes up. So that can be a time that I'm going to check it to see, okay, you've been on hormone replacement for three months. How are you feeling? If you're not feeling good, was it because you didn't absorb it? So I hope that um, makes sense. And again, if you have any questions about these points, save those questions and we'll answer them in about 20 minutes. Okay. Okay. All right. So another question. I am on the estrogen patch now for about seven um, months. My doctor is gone. I believe that I should increase my dose. What should I do? My symptoms are better, but I still have some. So what do you do in this situation? Number one is you need to find a physician that can help you with your dosages, okay? Um, now, if you are in New Brunswick, then you can go to the e-visit portal. You are able to access a physician or a nurse practitioner there, and you can ask to have your prescription increased. The other thing that I would say is if your symptoms are not completely there, what other aspects of health are you looking at? So when I do an assessment on a woman, um, it's not just her hormones, right? I look at gut, I look at breath, I look at her sleep, I look at her nutrition, I look at her exercise, I look at the way that she's pooping, because the, all those things tell us whether um, your body's getting in balance, if there's something more that you can do, and then we may decide to increase the estrogen if she's still having symptoms. So dial 811 to get your name on a doctor list, or go to e-visit so that you can find a practitioner that can increase your prescription. Okay, next question. Um, I had a hysterectomy at a young age of 35 
and had both ovaries and the uterus removed. How long should a woman be on HRT and should she have a personalized or just standard HRT? And this woman listed uh, Premarin as the treatment. So number one, definitely a woman at 35 needs to be on uh, hormone therapy and she most likely needs to be on it for life. We know now in the guidelines, both from the Medica Menopause Society and the International Menopause Society and the Canadian Medical Association, say there is no reason to stop a woman um, taking hormone replacement therapy. She can continue it indefinitely. So that is one question. So long-term. Now, should she have it personalized or just the standard Premarin? So Premarin is the pill form of uh, estrogen, okay? And it was one of the first forms that came out. It is still the cheapest. Premarin still does work well, okay? So Premarin works well. The one issue with Premarin, it gets absorbed, it goes through the liver, and it has to get metabolized there. When it gets metabolized, it actually can very minimally increase your blood clot risk, okay? So if you're on Premarin, and you've had a history of blood clots or you're worried about that, then I really feel women should switch over to estradiol. Um, so that would be changing things around. The majority of all of my patients now I place on topical estradiol. And the reason for that is because it lowers the clotting risk. Okay. So, so that would be one. I would say that, yes, switch over from Premarin to um, estradiol patch or the gel. And then should she have it personalized? Well, number one, I truly believe that women, even if they have a uterus out, need to be on some form of progesterone. Progesterone is not just about protecting the uterus. We have progesterone receptors in the brain. We have them in the nerve endings. We have them in the gut. And so it's going to give you um, more components to help all aspects of your health. Um, so I would say you should consider um, switching to estradiol topically and also adding on progesterone. And the progesterone that I generally use is Prometrium. It's a micronized progesterone. It's available on any pharmacy by prescription uh, and typically 100 or 200 milligrams at night, depending on someone's symptoms, but typically starting with the 100 milligram dosage. Next question. How do CBD and THC, which are used for sleep, how do they affect hormone levels? Well, the big question is we don't know how they affect hormone levels because they have not been studied. But I do know that THC and CBD have many of good uses within the body. So I uh, was a former, I have prescribed a medical cannabis when it was available in Bermuda or in Canada, and I was able to attend conferences. So we know that we have this massive system in our body called the endocannabinoid system. And that's where cannabis gets its name. It's not just marijuana or weed. So this endocannabinoid system really can have a lot of potential benefits for us. And when I first started prescribing, many of my patients that came in, they wanted a CBD or a cannabis therapy but when I actually looked at their symptoms, I actually prescribed hormonal replacement therapy instead. I feel that CBD can definitely help us. We know that there's a lot of research being done, of course, for sleep, for anxiety. Also, um, CBD and THC are being used intravaginally for those with endometriosis pain. And right now, we're still doing a lot more research. So one question you might ask, well, can they be combined? Well, most definitely. You know, I see a lot of patients that are taking hormonal therapy and maybe they still at times use a gummy at night. They might use a CBD oil or if they have chronic pain for another reason, they can use both of them together. Now, again, we don't have the research, but we don't have a lot of research on many things. We don't necessarily have research on the way that Advil and ibuprofen and gabapentin and Imovane and Celexa all work together, right? So in medicine, it really, we are, it is the art of medicine. So there are some things that are very scientific. It's scientific if you break a bone. I can tell you that we can take you to the operating room and we can fix it. But it, when it comes to uh, prescription-based therapies, there's always many factors that are involved. So THC, CBD, they um, have a role to play in our body and they can be used along with hormonal therapy. Next question. How can hormonal health affect women diagnosed with psychiatric conditions like bipolar or schizophrenia? Does it influence the effectiveness of medication or could it make symptoms worse? 
This is a great question, okay? So it's a wonderful question. How does it affect them? I think we have to think of even the diagnosis of these conditions. So many times I see women diagnosed with depression and anxiety, but even bipolar and schizophrenia. We know now that there was a term, it was called the psychosis, women's psychosis, there was a name, but many women were placed in psychiatric institutions around the time of their menopause transition because the erratic effects of the brain as they started losing their estrogens. So do the hormones impact the condition? Most definitely. So if you're a woman going through the transition, um, I think you really need to start looking at what's going on first with your hormones, because that can actually assist with your diagnosis. So that's number one, super important. And the other thing I'll put into this category is definitely depression, of course, anxiety disorders that we begin to see. So is it truly generalized anxiety? And is Celexa really the best medication? Or is the woman in the menopause transition, so I see this a lot, she's maybe 42, 43 years old, she's agitated, she's irritable, um, she goes to the doctor and they put her on an antidepressant. Uh, well, she's most likely in the early stages of menopause and perhaps a hormonal uh, therapy option could be better for her during this time. So the other part of this, um, and actually, as I talk about that one, I did want to speak about the study that was released by Dr. Lisa Moscone. So Dr. Moscone is a neuroscientist. She's a brain scientist, and she's a nutritionist. She works in New York. And just about a month ago, she released uh, uh, her research, which she's been working on for many years, and it was on estrogen receptors in the brain. So they were able to plot estrogen receptors, and they looked at women that were in kind of perimenopause, um, and then in the postmenopause period. And what did they find? It was very interesting. So in the early parts of menopause, there are estrogen receptors that light up in our brain. So these estrogen receptors are hungry for estrogen. And in the early part of menopause, what you start to see is that it's the hot flashes, that area that influences hot flashes in the brain, and the area that influences sleep. And then as you go through the transition, so later in the transition, you know, a couple of years later, three to five years, then what we start to see in the brain is the areas that control our mood and our cognition. So things like brain fog, memory, your irritability, your ability to make decisions. So these are now very well known and documented changes in the brain that happen as women go through the menopause transition. And they were just looking primarily at estrogen. So this is just the beginning. We don't even know the impact fully of things like uh, testosterone and progesterone that may be there as well. So the brain is changing. Now, the other part of this question on psychiatric conditions is could a hormonal therapy make these conditions or symptoms worse? Now, we don't have any research on this, um, but my question would be, if anything, it's going to help improve the symptoms. You may start to see for, for women that medication may need to be able to be adjusted to come off of the medication. I'm working with several women now and they say, I don't want to be on this SSRI. You know, I don't want to be on Celexa or Ciprolex. So I said, well, let's work on all aspects of your health and we can try to wean you off as you begin to feel better, or that is my hope for them. Um, so this is all a work in progress. We're going to have a lot more research on women's health in the upcoming years. So I'm really looking forward to be able uh, to be part of this movement um, as we advocate for women's health. Now, I just wanted to go, I had an online question here. So um, this was someone presented with a dry cough. So wondering, could this be hormones? So it's a dry cough that comes and goes. I have all kinds of tests, but nothing is showing up. It can last up to three weeks of a time. Now this person is 60 and has been coughing like this for about the last 10 years. But then she also comments that she has vaginal dryness and a type of sclerosis in the vagina. Um, there was no cancer, but it's very bothersome. So she uses a moisturizer for the dryness and she's wondering if that will help with the sclerosis. And then her other symptoms that she had were joint, uh, hip, and neck pain, and she's wondering if the hormones could be beneficial. So 
um, let me get to the different parts of this question, okay? So number one, the cough. So when I look at this question, I look at the different parts of it, okay? So some would say a chronic cough, well, maybe it's just allergies or what is it? But she's had it for 10 years um, and it sounds like antihistamines not have, may not have been working. But then I, she mentions in this question that she also had lichen sclerosis. So this is a condition of the vagina where it gets thin, it gets white. It literally gets white in color, but this can be seen as an autoimmune condition. So my flag here would be, does this woman have some degree of autoimmune illness? So autoimmune illness, this can be something like asthma that can develop, but it's not typical to develop asthma later in life. There's something that's the trigger for it. So then I would start to take a step a little bit further. So um, what's going on with the gut? Now, she didn't mention anything in her questioning, but I would say then, What's going on with the gut? Is there any problems with diarrhea, with constipation, with bloating? Because when the gut is not in balance, then we start to have manifestations in the skin. And she has this, she has this dryness in her vagina and this lichen sclerosis. So is it possible that the dry cough is simply from menopause? Well, I've not seen just a dry cough, but we do know that as we go through the transition, that women, your exercise capacity gets less and women are seen to be more short of breath and the vital capacity of the lungs is less. So what does this mean? You can feel more winded as you go through menopause. And this has to do with the capillaries. The capillaries are blood vessels. And we have those that surround our lungs that bring the blood into the lungs. Those blood vessels are diminished as you go through, um, or sorry, the blood vessels get diminished because it doesn't have as much estrogen supply. Estrogen is really important for our arteries, which are in and around the lungs. And so the lung capacity can go down. So is it possible that it's hormones? Possibly, but we need to dive a little bit further. So I would suggest uh, looking more at the gut for this person. Um, that would be one. And then her other questions, she's using um, a moisturizer for the dryness. So number one is any of you women out there, one of my top tips and the research is supporting this. And there's a lot of, you know, of, um, hormone doctors in that you'll see in social media that are advocating it. But I see this as such a game changer for so many women. If you have any vaginal dryness, if it hurts to have sex, if you're having recurrent bladder infections, if you're getting a lot of yeast or um, bacterial vaginosis infections, then get yourself on vaginal estradiol. Okay. So we have estrogen receptors in our vagina. So they're in all around the vulva, they're around our urethra when we pee, okay? Um, they're around our clitoris that contributes to us having orgasm, okay? And the, these hormones are completely safe. Estradiol used vaginally is even used for women that have had breast cancer, okay? So if there's anything that I think that should be given out like candy, I would give it to every uh, menopausal woman or perimenopausal woman. It comes in two forms. You can use it as a topical gel uh, that you insert inside, or you can get it as a little pellet that you put up on the inside as well. Or for women that don't want something to go all the way up inside, you can literally just take it out. I've told a few of my older patients, like 70 year old women, I say, just put some of the cream on the end of your fingers and put it up inside and then put it on the outer aspect of the vagina as well. So I would recommend that for this woman. Okay. And then the other question was, she said, the only other symptoms I have, I'm not sure if this is menopause, is pain in my hips and in my neck. Well, I'm not sure if any of you follow Dr. Vonda Wright, but Dr. Wright is an orthopedic surgeon and she just released a paper last week, which I'm going to comment on soon on Facebook, but it's called the musculoskeletal syndrome of menopause. So most definitely, we know that the aches and pains can come as estrogen drops and as progesterone drops. So way back when I was 41 and I was beginning to go through these changes, I started having pain in my knee. And I was thinking, what is going on? I had it examined. There was nothing there. There was no swelling. And when I went on progesterone, my knee pain went away. We know now we kind of move forward a few years, back pain, shoulder pains, aches and pains, this older, you know, this, these aches that we get of old age, it's a drop in estrogen within our blood. And many women, when they go on hormonal therapy, feel so much better 
Um, so you don't necessarily have to suffer with those aches and pains. Of course, there can be other reasons for it. Blood sugar is a primary reason that I look at. Um, but I don't want to dismiss that estradiol can have a huge impact for so many women when it comes to aches and pains. Love that question. Okay, um, I'll do maybe two more, then we'll go online. So I have a teenage daughter. She's using the Evra patch for irregular periods. What do I do? So I truly feel, especially in teenagers, that if you it is not needed for birth control, that we do not put teenage girls on the birth control pill or the patch, okay? Um, the reason for this is that we're not getting to the root of the problem. Number one, we don't know why they're having irregular pills, periods. And then when we go and put them on a birth control pill or patch, we're covering things up, but then we're setting them up for more long-term problems. So this is a game changer for me. When I got out of medical school, this is what I did. I put people on the pill for irregular periods. I thought I was balancing their hormones. I wasn't, I wasn't, and I don't do that anymore. I really get to the root cause because birth control pills, if you start a teenager on them, they're gonna be more prone to osteoporosis. Um, it really disrupts their mood. Anx I see a lot more anxiety and depression. We know that some girls will then go on to have even be put on anxiety pills. I spoke with a young girl the other day and I said, did you ever consider it could be the birth control pill that caused this person to have anxiety and not just a primary anxiety disorder? We know that long-term, it actually affects libido. And, you know, for most of the women out there, right, it's, it's never the easiest thing for orgasms to happen, right? So why would we want to take that away from a young girl and start her out when she's only 15 or 16 or maybe even 14 for irregular periods? So, um... So if she doesn't need for sex, sex for birth control, then I would say get her on something else. And then you have to evaluate what's going on. So one of the things is when girls first start having periods, it can take a while before they get regulated. It can take a couple of years. And so it's okay during that time to let it be irregular, okay? But there are some things that you can do to try to improve regularity. So one is food. And I know that's hard with teenagers, but uh, really... Uh, sugary, ultra processed food. Um, it causes inflammation in the body. It disrupts our circadian balance. It can disrupt our hormonal balance. So that can be one thing. Dairy can be another thing that's implicated with many uh, teenage girls with regularity, irregularity or heavy painful periods. But the other is to rule out polycystic ovarian syndrome. And so this would be girls as they're getting maybe 17, 18, they're gaining weight, they get acne, they have irregular periods you want to know if it's PCOS. Why do you want to know? Because if we just treat those girls with birth control pills and then they're 24 and they come off the pill or maybe they're 28 and they want to have a, ba a baby, then their risk for infertility is there because they're, they've never taught their body to ovulate and they never got to the root problem of the PCOS. So I want you to, um, to consider that. Okay, so I have more questions here, but what I'm gonna do now, um, and I hope that's been good for our audience that I will have out in the recording.